Okay, my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. I'm doing great. We are adventuring our way through the Mississippi Delta. We were supposed to go see Willie Nelson in concert tonight, but unfortunately somebody in his band got COVID and they had to cancel and postpone the show for another month. So we are going to, for the next couple of vlogs, be exploring the Delta. And today what I wanted to do is go to the grave of probably the most famous blues musician of all time, the legendary Robert Johnson. However, Robert Johnson has three graves. Here we go again, right? How many times have I vlogged somebody with multiple graves? They are all in the same general vicinity. One of them seems to be more credible than the others. But we'll talk about his historic life and how it became so wrapped up in mythology. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Robert Johnson was a man who had such a bizarre and kind of crazy childhood that no surprise that he would choose life on the road. And he literally spent pretty much his entire life as an adult on the road, playing clubs, playing wherever he could until he had an untimely death at the age of 27. And even that is shrouded in some mystery. All right, the Greenwood area is what we were looking for. All right, we are really close. Okay, I think we're finally getting somewhere. That says Robert Johnson grave, 2.3 miles. If you look over there in the distance, you can see a white church. He's buried at that church. So here we are out here in this very distant cemetery. Very few graves out here. It's called Little Zion. I do know that the grave is buried underneath a tree and I think it's uh, out there. Over here where we drove in they have a historical placard right over here. Let me go read that. Robert Johnson, a seminal figure in the history of the Delta Blues. Robert Johnson from, lived from 1911 to 1938. Synthesized the music of Delta Blues pioneers such as Sunhouse with outside traditions. He in turn influenced artists such as Muddy Waters and Elmore James. Johnson's compositions notable for their poetic qualities include the standard Sweet Home Chicago, and dust my broom. Johnson's mysterious life and early death continue to fascinate modern fans. He is thought to be buried in this graveyard. And up here they're memorializing Crossroad Blues, one of his famous songs. One that Eric Clapton would cite and made famous for himself as well. So let me read a little bit of this to you. It says, one of the most famous and legendary Delta Blues musicians, Robert Johnson, Although he recorded only 29 songs at two recording sessions in 1936 and 1937, his work has been included in the repertoires of countless blues and rock musicians since Johnson songs, I Believe, I'll Dust My Broom, Crossroad Blues, Love in Vain Blues, Traveling Riverside Blues, and Sweet Home Chicago became well known via the recordings of Elmore James, Eric Clapton, The Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, and many others. Johnson was born in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, but by 1920, he was living near Robbinsville, just south of Memphis. In the late 1920s, he took up the guitar and was learning to play from Willie Brown, Charlie Patton, and Sunhouse. By 1931, Johnson had returned to the Hazelhurst area and began studying with local bluesman Ike Zimmerman, an important influence on Johnson and his modern revolutionary style. Now it says from 1933 on, Johnson traveled around the Delta and to other parts of the country, including Memphis, St. Louis, Chicago, Detroit, New York, and even Canada. Johnson went from one juke to another, never settling in one place, although he did have a home in Helena, Arkansas for a time. Late in 1938, empresario John Hammond planned to present Johnson as part of the From Spirituals to Swing concert at Carnegie Hall, an appearance that would have undoubtedly made him an international star. Unfortunately, Johnson died before that event. He was allegedly poisoned at the juke joint behind the Three Forks store near the intersection of US Highway 82 and 49 East 
by the angry husband of a woman he was seeing. Confusing accounts of different deaths and burial sites have arisen, but local sources have related that he died on Star of the West Plantation just south of this site on August 16th and was buried here the next day. Now for a long time there were only two known photographs, this being the first of Robert Johnson. Now there are three but believed to be more, but the uh, there's some issues between family members and who owns the, the photos. But it says some believe that the legend that Johnson sold his soul in exchange for remarkable guitar playing skills that would make him famous and the story of his fateful meeting with the devil at a rural crossroads is an enduring blues theme. However, early blues songs are full of references to African-American folk magic and the devil. Johnson's lyrics were no exception. His song, Hellhound on My Trail and Me and the Devil Blues helped perpetuate the legend. Robert Plant, the iconic English rock band Led Zeppelin visited the gravesite here on November 25th, 2009 and left a note on the headstone that said, Traveling Riverside and the Lemon Song, 1965. Thanks, Robert. R.A. Plant, England. Then here, for a long time, they didn't even know what date he died. And it took like 30 years before a researcher uncovered his death certificate. And that's why there's some speculation as to where he really is buried. Because it says here that his death certificate shows a burial place only as Zion Church. Though there are two other sites known as Zion Church around here, both in southwest LaFleur County, long had been thought to be the last resting place of the iconic bluesman. It was not until 2000 that Johnson's true burial ground was identified. The recollections of Rose Eskridge, who was an eyewitness to the event and whose husband Tom had dug the grave, provided details to the existing information. Both Mr. and Mrs. Eskridge are also buried in this cemetery. This is the one that I wanted to come to first because it seems like this would be the most accurate because as I was going to mention it actually says on the placard that the person who dug the hole and his wife were the ones to verify they remember doing it. I believe he's back here in this corner. Look at it this way. One way or another, we're going to see his actual grave today, even if it's three of them. Here he is, right here under this kind of haunting tree. Very nice grave, though. Robert Johnson, what a life. We're actually here on the anniversary of his birth. So happy birthday, Robert. Robert L. Johnson, May 8th, 1911, August 16th, 1938, musician and composer. He influenced millions beyond his time. On there it says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of Jerusalem, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he will call me from the grave. It says, handwritten by Robert Johnson shortly before his death, and preserved among family papers by his sister. Oh, okay, that was the story. I was gonna say, I remember them saying that a note from his sister was on his headstone, so it was actually his handwriting. Now, Robert's story is pretty interesting because his father was a wealthy man named Charles Dodds, who he wasn't that wealthy, but he had land. And in Hazelhurst, Mississippi, he, apparently the KKK started coming after him. So. He left his wife and his nine children in Hazelhurst, and he went to Memphis and lived for a few years. While he was there, his wife ended up getting pregnant by a man named Noah Johnson, and they ended up having Robert. Robert never, ever met his father, it's believed, Noah Johnson, but as Robert grew up for a couple of years, he lived in Hazelhurst and then went to live with his father, Charles Dodds, in Memphis and Charles Dodds had then changed his name to Charles Spencer to a you know for safety and so Robert became Robert Spencer well in his teens his mother ended up getting together with a, another man who was 24 years younger than her and marrying him and Robert went to live with them and found out that Charles Spencer was not his real father and so he ended up changing his name 
to his father's name, Noah Johnson, to Robert Johnson. And when Robert moved in with his mother and her new husband, uh, they didn't get along. And so it was then that he would start learning to play the guitar from his brother. And he could play harmonica already. He was already a pretty fair singer. But he would start going out and seeing local musicians. And it was around that time that he would end up seeing Sunhouse. Now, some of that famous legend of Robert Johnson making his deal with the devil at the crossroads kind of came about because of Sunhouse. Sunhouse used to perform at the same place week after week, and he was living near Robert. And Robert used to go see him perform quite a bit and would admire his guitar playing. And while the band was taking breaks, he would ask Sunhouse if he could play his guitar. And Robert would go up there and play the guitar. And people would say that he was so bad that the people that were dancing would come over to Sunhouse and say, can you make that boy quit playing? He is so bad, he's annoying us. So that kind of got it started as to when Robert disappeared for a year and came back where the theory or where people said that he had made a deal with the devil came from. Now what kind of sparked some of that was that when he was 19, he got married and he married a woman when she was 16 and she ended up dying during childbirth. And that, they said that that was when he really kind of stopped connecting with people for the most part and just kind of threw himself into wanting to play music. Now, one of the theories was that he, as we saw on the placard, that there was a man who had um, taken him in named Ike Simmerman and for a year helped him and taught him how to play guitar. But there was also this story that Robert had went out to the crossroads at midnight and made a deal with the devil. And we'll talk about that when we get to another one of his supposed grave sites. But Robert was, you know, a legend eventually because he was so good that he'd only performed like, I think he recorded 29 songs and a few outtakes, but that was all in two recording sessions. He made his living on the road constantly. He was going from town to town, basically setting up his guitar in a barbershop or anywhere in town that he could get people's attention. He would start playing for tips and then people would see him in town and invite him to play at their bar or at their barn dance or whatever it was. On the other side of his headstone it says, when I leave this town, I'm on bid you fair, farewell. And when I return again, you'll have a great long story to tell from from four until late by Robert Johnson. It says this memorial marker is placed at the base of this old pecan tree, as was Robert Johnson himself prior to his burial nearby. In accordance with the account of eyewitness, Miss Rose Eskridge, as told by historian Stephen C. Laver. So sad that Robert never knew his father. His mother and he were not very close. He had a lot of half siblings and his wife had died giving birth to their child now now he did apparently in 1930 have a child out of wedlock and then the following year got married again but his second wife ended up dying as well so god talk about just unbelievable series of events that's kind of why he just lived so much on the road and didn't connect with anybody anymore now he did have a woman that he would date and he like in, you know, various towns, probably many women in various towns, because that's kind of the, the story to his death. But one of them he mentions at the end of Love in Vain, and she never even knew about it. It wasn't until they were making that documentary mentioned on the placard in 1990 that they tracked her down and played the recording of Love in Vain for her. And at the end, you know, Robert does like a, basically a shout out to her, says her name at the end and everything. And she was like just completely in disbelief because it had been 50 years. And, you know, now she's hearing this love song that he he wrote for her 50 years before. His death was really mysterious because they were it kind of happened out of nowhere and the death certificate didn't list a cause. They didn't do an autopsy. It was, you know, he, he wasn't that wealthy or anything, so they just didn't see a need for it at the time, apparently. So it left a lot of uh, 
speculation since as to what what, what might have caused it. Now he was staying apparently at a at a place a few miles away from where he was playing the last couple weeks of his life. He was doing some plantation barn dance kind of gigs and playing a lot. And um, apparently the guy that he was staying there on his land said that he believed it was syphilis and that there was this theory that Robert had been born with syphilis from his parents, like inherited syphilis from his parents. But then the other story came about that um, I believe it was Sonny Boy Williamson told the story that uh, somebody tried to give Robert a drink the, uh, the night before he died at the club and Sonny Boy slapped it out of Robert's hand and said, you don't drink a drink that somebody buys you? What's wrong with you? And, um, and Robert said, don't you ever slap a drink out of my hand and ask for another drink and then drank it and apparently got really ill from it. So they thought that it was poison. For years, they speculated that it was strychnine, but then some experts came in and said, no, even in alcohol, you would have smelled something as strong as strychnine. Now, what's crazy is that a researcher um, many years later had heard a rumor that people in town knew who it was that bought him the drink and who poisoned the drink. And apparently this researcher went out and tracked down the man and ask him and off the record the guy said yes I did poison him and I just I never thought the boy would die he didn't mean to kill him he just meant to make him sick because apparently uh, Robert was flirting with his wife at those last barn dances I want to see if I can find the people that dug his hole and helped us find out where He's actually buried. So I found her. She's actually right over here by the tree line, all the way on the far side, right where there's an opening. Miss Rosetta Eskridge. Thank you, Rose, for remembering history. From one road traveler to another. Now, just in case this isn't Robert's grave, we will go to the other two as well and tell a little bit more of his story. No help whatsoever. I was just crossing this bridge and saw this sign that said, Bobby Gentry, born Roberta Lee Streeter in Chickasaw County in 1944 and spending her childhood here, Bobby Gentry brought the accents, sounds, and images of Delta life into scores of haunting songs she wrote and record records she made to become one of the most influential country and pop artists of the 1960s and 70s. With her phenomenal number one hit, Ode to Billy Joe, and complex innovative albums such as the Delta Suite, she brought the sultry musical flavors of Mississippi country to the world. I do plan in the future on coming back here and going out to the place where he played and where he passed away and all that stuff. I didn't want to do everything Robert Johnson all in one day. Also not going to the crossroads today because much like his grave, there are multiple locations where people believe that it is. So now we've arrived at what we believe is the second burial ground at Payne Chapel Baptist Church. So if you come out to the back of the church, he's right here, right almost next to the tree line. Blues Hall of Famer, Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. There you can see May 8, 1911, resting in the blues. I think the way that I found out about Robert was when they released the, they did like a complete recordings of all of his songs that he recorded in those two sessions. He did one at the Gunter Hotel, which I'm going to go and vlog that at some point in San Antonio. But, uh, and then the other was in Dallas. He did those 29 recordings plus some alternate takes 
I bought that and I liked it, but I wasn't super into it until someone said, oh, you got to see the movie Crossroads with Ralph Macchio. And I'm like, what's that all about? They go, oh, you'll love seeing Steve Vai in it. And when I watched the movie, the movie was great. It was like this guitar student who's training in like classical guitar finds out that there is supposedly a secret Robert Johnson song that was never recorded. And he sets off to find a member of Robert's band from the end of his life in a retirement home. He goes to find this guy to teach him the lost song. And they incorporate the whole crossroads thing where Ralph Macchio is basically the playing Robert Johnson in a club where he has to face off against the devil who's Steve Vai. Now let's go out to where the third grave is. So the next cemetery that we're gonna be going to is only like seven minutes away. So now we've made out to Mount Zion here in Morgan City. And right over here They have a memorial to him. Now apparently they don't necessarily come around and say that they believe he's buried here, but it's strange that they would have one of these here if they didn't think so. I think this is the one that Sony paid for because when Robert made his recordings, and this one's kind of nice actually, only at the time, probably this would have been when they only had two known photos one being the famous one of him and his suit that we already saw. And then this one was one in like a little drugstore photo booth. Then when his sister, his half sister released her book, she released another photo from the same day and time and everything. Cause he's wearing the same clothes and has the same guitar. I'll show that picture here. But it says, Robert Johnson, King of the Delta Blues Singers. His music struck a chord that continues to resonate. His blues addressed generations he would never know and made poetry of his visions and fears. There's stuff all the way around it. When he made his recordings, I think they were eventually bought by Columbia, who owns, Sony is owned by, owns Columbia now, so. It says, born in Hazelhurst, Copia County, the recording career and brief transit of Robert Johnson left an enormous legacy to American music. Preserved for the ages by the Columbia Recording Company, the body of his work is considered to be among the most powerful of its kind, a haunting and lyrical portrait of the human spirit. I believe it was actually, it was voted when they released the compilation in the 60s of all of his stuff on LP. I believe it was actually said it was one of the most important recordings of all time. And I know that um, Crossroad Blues is in the Hall of Fame. Now this has a listing of a lot of his songs. So I'll get into the song titles here in just a second, but I think that gives us a good reason to talk about the deal with the devil. Right around 1930 or 31, 32, probably more likely about 1931, all of a sudden Robert wasn't seen. People weren't seeing him around at the clubs anymore. And he obviously, you know, not being good and people complaining about him playing in between sets wasn't going to help his career. So he kind of vanished. And, um, you know, that's when, I guess in the 50s, uh, the brother of a man named Tommy Johnson said that Tommy made a deal with the devil at the crossroads and that not related. Tommy Johnson was not related to Robert Johnson, just same last name. But people started kind of connecting that story with Robert's story as well. And the, the idea was that Robert went off to learn how to be a great guitar player and hooked up with this man named Ike Zinnerman, who taught him how to play. And be, in those days, the houses were not built as well soundproof wise so if you were learning guitar you were learning an instrument a lot of the times they would send you 
maybe even like here, out into the fields to play or out into the cemetery or out into the road because you wouldn't bother anybody. Kind of like the way it is right here. So that was kind of the idea behind it was that Robert went out after midnight, was walking and was playing his guitar, came upon the crossroads and the devil appeared. He offered Robert a deal and uh, the story was that the devil takes Robert's guitar, tunes the guitar, plays a song, and the deal is made for Robert's soul, an early ending to his life. So it's kind of crazy, you know, they believe that would have been around 32 because he came back in 33 and was a really good player, ended up playing everywhere from 33 till he died in 38, and then in 36 was when he made his recordings. But a lot of people also looked into the song titles. That's why I said we'll get back to this in a second, because a lot of the song titles then made people believe, well, is he telling us something in the song titles? Because you had Crossroad Blues, which was about that story. You had uh, Hellhound on My Trail, Me and the Devil Blues, Last Fair Deal Gone Down, yeah, things like that, kind of, especially those bottom songs, those kind of make you think that there could have been some validity to the story. Then over here, it says, you may bury my body down by the highway side. This memorial erected April 20th, 1991, through the generosity of people across America with profound respect and appreciation for the people and culture of the Mississippi Delta. Well, my friends, I think that's going to do it for us for today. We have seen quite a lot. And like I said, in the future, we'll go and we'll see his childhood home in Hazelhurst where he grew up. They have a lot to see there. Not so much of the house. The house is there, but there's a museum there dedicated to the Delta Blues and Mississippi music. We'll do a video on the places that he was at at the end of his life, where he was performing, where he stayed and passed away. And we'll go to all the locations that they claim could be the crossroads. Hope you enjoyed this. I hope if you've never heard Robert Johnson's music, I hope you'll go check it out. Thank you all for watching. If you're new here, please go subscribe, hit that notification bell, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great night. Goodbye. Goodbye.